Welcome to The Upshot, Multi-World Disc Golf's podcast about the latest in the disc golf world. I'm the editor, Charlie Eisenhut. Joining me is Josh Mansfield on this Tuesday, July 9th. I hope everybody had a great holiday weekend. Josh, perhaps you can see what I got done over the holiday weekend. I, I love it. It looks it's it's an incredible looking background and wall. Uh, Thank you. The signs, the discs. It's it's a nice it's a nice touch. They sent you some good stuff. Shout, shout out to the disc companies for sending over yeah. some things to put up on the wall. Uh, yeah, I got some good stuff. I got some good stuff. We got New York Rangers Prodigy disc here. I told Yuli I was going to put up a Captain's Raptor to squash the beef, and I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll probably move stuff around so we can kind of get a there you go. different sense of things. Th- this is a special one down here. That's an official guts disc from 2016 World Championships. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm uh, I'm nice. pumped. And yeah, by the way, great. none of these are from the mystery boxes. Oh, okay. So th- <laughs> these were all because you got those from sponsors before or from uh. The manufacturers before the mystery box thing, right? Yeah, I just I just emailed and was like, hey, yeah. like I'd love to put a couple of your discs up on the wall. And so folks sent discs. Except MVP. They Ooh. said they were gonna and they didn't. Oh my god. No MVP discs up here right now. It's on them. It's on them. It's on them. I don't know what it's to tell them. you. Yeah. Don't want that free advertising, you know? I guess not. <laughs> but we will we will cycle these out. Um and uh yeah with it's uh josh i mean I, how was your fourth of july uh it was good you're glad good. handing yeah. as a politician yep yep kissing babies chicken hands you know do <laughs> do people uh, like know you do, like are you recognized because i would imagine not really given that you kind of have a, a city council job it's not exactly right uh um, it's not mayor no. No, it's not. No, 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 no. I'm definitely not recognized nearly as much as the mayor. I am recognized in especially like professional circles. So like if I ever go to like chamber, when I go to chamber events, uh, th- things like that, I can, sure. I can get recognized. But otherwise, like, no, not like walking down the street, not nearly as often. Well, uh, it sounds like fun. Yeah. Um, we've got a lot to talk about because there were a lot of big tournaments this past weekend. Of course, we had the Des Moines Challenge, the last DGPT stop in the U.S. until August with Ledgestone. And we also had the Finnish National Championships and the Estonian National Championships happening over in Europe as we get ready for this uh, European swing to really get started for real. It already feels like it's underway, but now we're done. It's all Europe for the next month. So lock in. European Open right around the corner. And we got some more European Open stuff to get to. Josh, I'm just going to tease it right now. We're going to talk about it in thir- in our 30-second rule segment. They changed hole 16. It's not a bunker rule anymore. You can't take an unlimited number. There's now two drop zones. I have thoughts. I also have <laughs> thoughts. We will get to those thoughts in a little bit. First, Des Moines Challenge. Anthony Barella wins his fourth tournament of the year. He's back up on top, Josh. Um, And Emily Weatherman becomes the fifth FPO player to win their first tournament on the Pro Tour in a single season. That's a brand new record by a lot. The previous record was two. Emily Weatherman, 18 years old, had never shot a 1,000 rated round before in her career. And as now goes back to back, thousand eight and ten twenty six, to win the Des Moines Challenge against basically the whole field except Kristen. Amazing. Yeah, it, it, it was it was a spectacular performance and one that it really is one of those stories about like. I think it gets some of the hype because so much of the excitement around young players is focused on MPO, and rightfully so. Uh, you know, the top of the standings is a 19-year-old kid, but it's exciting then to have on the flip side FPO storylines developing of young, talented FPO players as well that we get to add to counterpoint on the MPO side. Emily Weatherman is your rookie of the year front runner. And I've got a little exercise for us to do in a moment, Josh, but we'll, we'll say we're going to do some rookie rankings over the last five years. Um, before we get to that, I just want to talk a little bit more about AB. And by the way, we spent a full show already on our rapid reacts about the Des Moines Challenge. 
for all of our subscribers. We hope you join. Listen into that. Discgolf.ultiworld.com slash subscribe. Less than $4 a month. You get every single rapid react that we do. But we're doing, we're doing daily rapid reacts for the European Open next week. Exciting. Um, AB, four wins. He joins this list of players with at least four elite series and major wins in a single season. Okay? You ready? Yep. Paul McBeth, who's done it seven times, which is insane. It's Ricky Wysocki, who's done it four times. Barry Schultz did it three times. Dave Felberg did it three times. Eagles done it twice. Ken Climo did it once. Simon Lazat did it once. And now Anthony Barella has done it once. That's quite the company to keep if you're AB, Josh. Yeah, it really is. Especially because, what, Macbeth, Wysocki, and Lazat? Oh, and McMahon. Uh, you know, they, they are your active players. And, and this gets harder and harder as time goes on. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to knock too hard on, on the old guys in that list, but... The, because to, they're, to be fair to the old guys, it used to be even harder because there were no. It turns. did. It's <laughs> it's like it's like a bell curve, right? Like there yeah, was a, yeah. there was a period where it was really hard because there just weren't that many tournaments. Like you played the four majors and that was it. And so you either you there were not four, there were not four majors. There were not four there was majors. Like one you're, major. you're right. You're right. There was like one major. <laughs> well, first of all, there were no NTs at all or a quote unquote right. elite series until 2003. So Ken Climo was basically just out in the wilderness. Obviously, <laughs> if you sort of had some. Sort Sort of way of classifying in retrospect top tournaments ken would probably be near the top of this list sure but. sure right so so then 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 like the a number of elite series like went up and you have you know guys like Macbeth and Wysocki doing it multiple times but now the competition's getting so tight that that ability is going back down on the other side so it, it anthony brell is on the the back side of this downward curve and uh, it makes it a very very impressive accomplishment especially given that this is his first season winning and he is the record holder for most pro tour wins in a season in which you won your first uh, not shocking not shocking not shocking um, and he's tied for the lead all time elite series and majors in a single season during your first victory. Okay. The the other two players on that list, Kerry Berlegar in 2004 in FBO, and then Eagle in 2018 in MPO. Because remember, does that, Josh, does Eagle that mean like that includes Kota Piste. It probably do, it does. It does. <laughs> it has to. It does. Because remember, Eagle like couldn't win, couldn't win, couldn't win, couldn't win, and then was like. I'm about to go crazy. And he yes. won LVC yeah. to kick off the year. He won GBO, now DDO, RIP GBO. Um, he won the Beaver State Fling. So he won three of the first four NTs. And then he uh, won Kona Piche Day for his mm -hmm. fourth. And, I mean, came close to some other ones. I mean, he was third at the uh, Hall of Fame Classic that year. Uh, it was in a fantastic season. For, I, for I think it is very, very real possibility Anthony Barella breaks this record. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he could break it next week. I could break it next is week. Is he playing this weekend at Crow Cole? Uh No. Oh, yeah. I lie. Yes. Yes. Tentatively. I, like, I'm still not... It's hard for me to remember that he's still not rated 1040. I know. I'm That's like, what? so weird. Um... It's taking time for him to climb the ladder, but he also had some some rough play in the, the last few weeks. Right. I, I I mentioned this on the Rapid Reacts, but I want to I want to draw attention to it again. Here's his finishes from the season. Okay, <laughs> you ready? Yep. Starting at Chess.com. First, fourth at Waco, fourth at at Austin, first at Texas States, first at Jonesboro, seventh at Music City, tenth at Champions Cup, fourteenth at DDO. 18th at OTB, 44th at Portland, 61st at Beaver State. And then he was like, nah, I'm going to get back to it. 7th Preserve, 1st Des Moines. Just needed a break, man. What the heck? Just, just needed a break. <laughs> <laughs> the slump is over, Josh. The slump, slump, slump buster over. official, yeah. he's back. 
Yeah. I, I, you know, looking, he's got, I just pulled up his rating detail and we'll get, we'll get into this a little bit more in 30 second rule, but like he's carrying a couple 970 rounds from MVP open last year. Uh, 999 Isle Weidel, uh, 992 at Ledgestone last year, 972 PCS open last year. Um, I'm yeah. telling you, man, it, it was a straight up slump for, for somebody who's got the baseball style jerseys, loves the Diamondbacks. Like <laughs> this is exactly what it looks like for the world's best baseball players, right? They are crushing it, crushing it, crushing it. And then they just get cold. Otani. Just struck out 15 times in his last 29 at bats before this weekend. He, he was in a brutal slump. But obviously, you look at it over the course of the season, and I think we need to think about disc golf the same way. It does right. make it more impressive when you have players like what Calvin did last year, where they basically never go into a bad stretch. They just play amazing the whole season. And I think that's the that's more the rarity. And yeah. uh, Oh, definitely. But yeah, AB AB catching fire again at the right time, huh? Yeah, he absolutely is. Uh, right, right before an event that he, you you gotta think he wants. If if you're Anthony Barella, he said as much. Did he? Yeah, I'll get you the quote. Go ahead. Okay, uh, but I was about to ask if, if you had the choice between winning European Open versus one of the other majors this season, do you pick European Open? Just is, for the just for the uh, no no. But you I still, think, would still pick you still worlds, think worlds. Okay. but I do think there's like the the revenge on the on that last year is yeah. is for sure on his mind. He said he said, "quote I'm just ready for the next one. I couldn't have asked for a better way to go into Europe, and I'm just ready for the European Open. That's all that's been on my mind." Yeah. Yeah. I, Barella, by the way third streak of seven birdies in a row during that final round from this season um he did it twice at texas states <laughs> he went 11 in a row took a par and then went eight in a row in that crazy win where he held off a scorching hot gannon burr yeah uh so you know he put the pressure on adam hammis immediately to start this final round josh and as great as adam had played uh, with the with the sparkling fourteen under in round two, I just feel like the the pressure that A B can put on you and that Gannon can put on you is uh, out of this world. And like I just I don't like Adam ends up finishing fourth. I don't blame him. It's like yeah. it's not even the pressure of the moment as much as it is like if I don't birdie, I'm falling behind. Mm -hmm. Because AB is just going to be relentlessly birdieing, and that's what he did. Yep. Um, Adam goes six down in the front nine and goes one over in the back nine. Well, and Adam goes six and, down in the front nine and loses a stroke to AB. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, on track to, to do 12 under and, and losing strokes. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, that, that stretch in the middle there, like... When A B birdies yeah, oh. ten, eleven, twelve and like is parking multiple holes in that stretch and it's three straight pars for Hamas, you could like feel the tournament slipping between his fingers and like by the time you get into the late stages it was already over. It was done. Yeah. That that's the thing, is like A B finishes at eleven under. If Gannon was closer, A B could have finished fourteen. Sure. Right? Like he, sure. he he took his foot off the gas, and yep. rightfully so. I mean, he he was well ahead and had every reason to. But yeah, yeah, Lay, laying it up on eighteen, all that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, when 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 he gets hot, it's. I feel like the all, the only player who can keep up is Gannon, mm -hmm. who I will mention had more birdies this weekend than any other player in the field. Mm hmm. Uh, Gannon Burr was your number one birdie leader, fifty nine percent. Anthony Barella was second at fifty seven percent. Unfortunately for Gannon, though, just had too much gray on that scorecard. Uh, yeah, a couple, a couple of big, big numbers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, double. Uh, let's see. He uh, he double bogeyed eighteen in round one, and then he double bogeyed seventeen in round three. Yeah, that that was the nail in the coffin too. Like, yep. Yeah, I mean, if he birdies seventeen. 
Uh, there's pressure. I still think Barella wins, but there's pressure. I think so too. Yeah. And I mean, he was on a he was on like a course record setting pace before that. Right. He had only missed two birdies through 16. He was 14 down through 16. Insane. It was, it was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. Gannon, by the way, is now the highest rated player in the world. Yes, he is. Round uh, PGA ratings update just hit today and he has crossed back into the 1050 land no the first time in his career into, right first time in the fi- I, 10 I, first time into the 50 land yes yeah. i meant i meant for any player because we had nobody oh. over 1050 last month um i believe calvin was you know what somebody <laughs> just take over I, i'll leave this up i'll move out somebody else come sit here <laughs> okay <laughs> Gannon is now the only player over 1050 at 1051 rated <laughs> and is number one in the world. And it feels right to me. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, that, 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 that feels spot on uh, it. And, and he is bo- both on the sense of like the relative scale of his peers being the highest rated player in the world, but also the fact that he's broken the 1050 mark. It, it feels like he's playing at a level that is just, quite high i mean you, you look at his finishes and we were talking about you know consistently good versus slumping and such uh gannon has one finish outside the top 10 yep. this season uh it, it was 13th at otb and that is it after that he's won both of the elite plus events he's got beaver state fling as well so he's only one behind anthony barella uh and then most of his finishes are in the top five i mean he's got tons of podiums in there as well so it, it is it, it's well deserved it feels correct um you know that there are other ratings that I think don't quite feel the same to me, but this one just is spot on. Yeah, I think. Here's the question, Josh. Okay. And I don't, I don't want to beat the horse too long, so just a snap answer. Okay. Season ends today. Who's player of the year? Gannon Burr. I you, you I give it to him over AB, despite AB having the extra win. If if AB cleans up, like let's let's say neither of them win again but AB doesn't finish outside the top 15 for the rest of the season, then I think there's a very compelling argument that Anthony Barella wins player of the year. But right now the slump represents such an outsized portion of his season. It's hard to, to overcome that. So, yeah. 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 I think, I think, I think it's a fair, I think it's close, but I think it's fair argument to make that you give it to Gannon. Um, very similar in some ways to the Isaac versus, uh, Calvin discussion from last year little bit, yeah. Anyway, we, we, will, we will leave that where it is. There's lots of season <laughs> left. Obvious, for week to week, the answer changes right. because there's multiple people who are near the top, and there's still guys besides those two who could, could win it. I mean, we have yeah. a lot of majors in front of us. We have some guys who haven't been playing that. Like, you know, what if Presnell gets going again? I'm not counting on that, but it could happen. No one was counting on Isaac to win Worlds either, so. That's right. Um, can you name the five first-time Elite Series major winners at FPO this year? Uh, I'm giving you one for free. Emily Weatherman. Okay, Emily Weatherman. <laughs> Silva Sarnan. Silva Sarnan. Uh, oh, uh, Holland and Ella won. Uh, yeah, and a good call. I thought you might miss Holland because of uh, throw pink, but that's right. And there's one more. This this is the one who beat Kristen. It was um yeah. Yeah. Uh, Texas States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um who was it? Who was it? Who was it? Who was it? <laughs> um because I wanna say I wanna say uh Katie Al Salu, but I know that's Al Salu, but that, I know that's not right. Um on a consent. There that's you go. It was. Very yeah. nice. Yep, yep, yep. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Pre- pretty impressive. Um and it's kind of shocking because remember how this t- season started? It was like Evelina, Kristen, and it was okay. More Kristen, and, and instead, but now we have all of these people yeah. winning. Yeah, and Kristen will be back this weekend, which is hope, exciting. Hope you enjoyed it while it lasted, yeah, folks. <laughs> a nice, nice time. For it. <laughs> well, welcome back to reality. <laughs> um, Emily Weatherman, pretty amazing stuff. You know, Owen Scoggin sets the course record in round two. Mm-hmm. is playing out of her mind uh you know doing her typical thing making all her putts 
Let's look at these round two stats real quick. She goes eight for eight from circle one, three for eight from circle two. She puts it inside a green, you know, on the circle in regulation, 15 out of 18 holes. Just absolutely cooking out there. Mm -hmm. And she's got a three shot lead going into the final round. Emily Weatherman, by the way, at this point is five shots back of Scoggins. And then Scoggins with the least dog like performance that you've seen. In a long time from her, the dog the dog abandoned her. It was <laughs> an insane. She she goes zero for two from circle two. She misses four circle one putts. She only gets into the circle uh, in regulation on half the holes. What the heck happened to Owen Scoggins? It wasn't even that windy. No, it was weird. I I think she's hurt. That that's a that is a fair question given just how poorly she played. I mean, listen. Own needed a four under wins it for own. Comfortably. Right? Well, I shouldn't Com- say comfortably, but no, but that gets her to nineteen under. Yeah. Right. Um. So so a four under wins it for own. Uh. That a four under, a three under keeps her tied. Right. Because she yeah. she went one over par. A three under. Na- that's After what shooting Natalie ten Ryan's down charmed. in round two. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Uh. The three under was only rated nine eighty five. I mean that it's a good round, but it's not like it's. It's not Herculean. You don't need anything crazy out there. Yeah. Just go shoot a good... Go shoot your rating. Owen needed to shoot her rating. She shot a 953. Yeah. When is the last time she shot that bad of a round? I'm going to look. Portland Open, final round, 944. Very different circumstances, though, because uh, given, like, you know, just literally set the course record. I know. And, and had every reason to succeed on this course. Very strange. So, yeah. But hey, Emily Weatherman stared down the pressure and did she not did. blink. She did. She did not blink. She canned critical putts throughout the back nine. She hit a 40 footer on 11. She hit back to back 30 foot, uh, outside 30 foot putts on 17 and 18 to mm-hmm. basically lock it up. I mean, the, the yeah. outside the circle one on 17 was quite the putt to hit. It was, it was incredible. And yeah. for an 18-year-old to be doing that is <laughs> wild. Right. She, right. she is now the youngest player to win a pro tour uh, on FPO. Haley Sad. King had, I think, just turned 19 when okay. she won the pro tour championship in 21. Impressive performance. Impressive. It's a, that's a great accolade to have. And it's one that doesn't feel like it's going to be beat anytime soon. Uh, it's easy to say that. It's been three years since somebody just set that record. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, fair. <laughs> Ellie Midling could do it. Ellie Midling could do it. She's still 16. She's got a couple of years to do it. You're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> um, Ellie Midling, number two hmm. in the rookie of the year race behind you won't be surprised Emily Weatherman but it's fairly close it is it's surprisingly close yeah it's still within the realm of possibility that Midland could win the award well uh very much so given the fact that 66 percent of this award is not determined based on performance it's media and fan vote or tour card holder vote oh is that right I from the pro so, tour rookie yeah. yes interesting I'll I'll double check that real quick. Well, it, uh, I think a media vote right now would be a slam dunk, hundred percent. Everybody votes for Weatherman. Uh, agreed, agreed. So yeah. something would have um, to change in the second half. R- rookie of the year, thirty three percent world standings, thirty three percent media vote, thirty three percent tour card holder vote. Well, by the way, we're more than halfway through the season right now. Think about oh, yeah. that. Yeah, it's July. It is three more months. Well, four. It's kind of crazy. It's it's about to get wild. It's about to the 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 it's, relentless. It's going to be an intense. We got a lot of majors packed into this uh, last yeah. couple months. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, so speaking of rookies, I want to do some rookie rankings. Okay. Okay. So here are your rookies of the year. We used the Pro Tour criteria and winners. For back through 2021, because the before that they didn't give out the award, 
So we use PDGA for those. All right. Here they are. Uh, 2023, Luke Taylor and Silva Sarnan. 2022, Isaac Robinson and Emily Beach. 2021, Gannon Burr and Juliana Corver. Can you believe that Gannon Burr was the rookie of the year in 2021? That dude feels like he's been here for a long, long, long time at this point. Uh, 2020, Kyle Klein and Cap Merch. 2019, Luke Humphreys and Christine Jennings. And your current leaders, uh, Weatherman, of course, and Jesse Niemannen, who's a little bit ahead of Maudie Villman and could go either way. Uh, the uh, top U.S. player in the uh, rookie standings is Calvin Longquist. So, Josh, looking ahead, I want you to think about the totality of these players' career. Let's rank our top three rookies projecting to the future of the last five years. So, you know, define that however you want. Okay. Their right. Hall of Fame or, yeah. you know, Shed of Fame. <laughs> or most wins, most major, yep. whatever. It doesn't matter. Like, yeah. Assume that we're having a discussion about this in twenty years. Yep. Where 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 are these people? Where do you be? go? Uh, all right. Let's. let's so start again, over. the list in FPO is Weatherman, Sarnan, Beach, <laughs> Corver. <laughs> <laughs> That Corver is eliminated from discussion. Okay, I was okay. about to say because Corver Corver has to have she would win the win. Yeah, yeah she yeah. would win. It's a stu- it was so yes. stupid that they gave her this award. So let's just dig- congratulations to J.K. on a comical <laughs> award, but we're not going to include she, the discussion. She is the the like the the greatest. What is it like the the she's the goat of rookies. That's that's what her title is yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, okay. Weatherman, Sarnan, Beach, Merch, Jennings. Um. Give uh, I I go Silva in the one. I go. <sighs> Weatherman's so young. I just don't know. Uh, I'm not gonna overreact to this weekend. I'm going Silva, Cat, Emily, Emily Weatherman. I mean those those are the three players with wins. I I don't think, yeah. Though that's my podium. Were we just doing podiums? Yeah, top three. Okay, okay. Top three. Right. Top three. That's my list. What's what's your FPL uh, list? Who's more promising, Weatherman or Silva? I don't think it's an easy question to answer. I think we've already seen about how good Cat Merch is going to be. I, yeah. I'm going to go Weatherman, Silva, Merch. Weatherman, Silva, Merch. Yeah, okay. I think so. The polish on Emily's game is already so high. And I feel like she has like a... I mean, they, have, they, have, they play a similar style, no doubt. They do. They play a similar style. Weatherman's a little younger, and she showed that like killer instinct in a way that I don't necessarily know that we've seen. I mean, has Silva won a tournament as stacked up as what Emily Weatherman just won? I I like I'm gonna go look because I I think the answer is is definitely not. Pro- probably not because what Swedish Open is probably her best. And you had Hannah, Ella, Evelina, and then like a lot of the top Europeans. Yeah. Is that more impressive than Weatherman beating out Missy Own, Haley, et cetera? Pro- probably not. So. It, but probably it's not, not in a that vacuum. far off. It, but it's not far off. And she's done it multiple times. It's true. Right? Like she wins a lot in Europe against top Europeans. And. I think that as she continues and as, you know, the European tour is integrated, like she, that is more opportunity for Silva. And, and, and so, but I, I respect the pick. I, I definitely do. Uh, Weatherman just eclipsed 940 rated. Uh, Silva is 968 rated. I mean, that's the other big thing. It's a fair right? point. I, but again, we got to think ahead. 
Here's a question right. for you. If we included okay. Ellie Mittling in this conversation, would you put her on your podium? Yeah, probably over Cat Merch. But not ahead of Silva. No. I think I put her at number one. Is that crazy? Her, I, I don't think so. I mean, she's got the raw talent this, in this, terms of. The, yeah. Th- yep. Uh, just the absolute ability to throw it far. I, I just think, like, you can grow into the other parts of the game. And she's a pretty good sure. putter, is the thing. It's not like she sucks on the green. Ah, uh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. All right, how, let's do MPO. Okay. Luke Taylor, Isaac Robinson, Gannon Burr, Kyle Klein, Luke Humphreys, and Yesse Niemann. I'm, I'm letting you go first. Did you say first. what current standings are on MPO? I don't know if we did. Uh, I did. Niemann oh, and Vilma. Okay. okay. Longquist. Ne- yep. Yep. Okay. Um, Gannon number one. It's not even close. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <sighs> this is actually hard. I think this is hard. I think I go Kyle Isaac. It's my pitch too. But it's hard because look, a Isaac's world's in the bag. He got him in the bag. <laughs> a world's in the bag is worth more than two in the bush. You know what I mean? That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, true. Like Kyle right. might never win a world's, but I just feel like long run. I believe a little bit more in Kyle Klein. And, and it's not like Kyle's without majors. He, he also That's is a point. major winner, That's right? He's, he's got the USDGC. If he had no majors, then I think I, I prefer the two majors in bag with Isaac Robinson. But but given that Kyle still has one major, and if you ask me in five years, is it more likely that Kyle Klein or Isaac Robinson wins another major? My, my pick's got to be Kyle. It's stunningly close right now. You ready for the stats? I am. They both have three wins. At okay. least series and majors. Kyle has 11 podiums. Isaac has 12. Um, Kyle's played almost 20 more events than Isaac, so we need to kind of keep that in mind. Average finish, Kyle Klein, 20.8. Isaac, 22.2. Um, podium percentage, Isaac has the edge. 21% to Kyle's four, 14%, excuse me. But in top ten and twenty and top twenty percentage, Kyle has the edge. Uh, money per event, twenty six hundred for Kyle, twenty nine hundred for Isaac. But Isaac does more of his winning more recently, so that skews right. things. Very close. It is as it stands close. today. Yeah. I but so what do you do? Isaac Robinson does get the nod right now, ten forty one to ten thirty nine. So it it is it is remarkably close. So what's your what's your list? What's your ranking order? I I go same as you still. Okay. I, I go Gannon. I go Kyle. I go Isaac, and and maybe that's a little bit disrespectful, but I I just think we've seen Kyle in terms of sustained play over seasons make me think that there's a good chance that like he can. He can win another major and, and continue to do that. He's sixth in the Pro Tour standings right now um, compared to Isaac's 10th. So I, maybe it's a little disrespectful to Isaac. I did a lot of that last season, but <laughs> yeah, I give I give the nod to Kyle. Um, the real disrespect is for Luke Humphreys not making the list. I I completely forgotten that he won Rookie of the Year. I can't believe you would because he's not young, right? Relative to these guys. I, I don't think so. I mean, definitely I mean, not relative also, to these guys. Yeah, I also had forgotten that Juliana Corver won Rookie of the Year. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think he's in his 30s. I think he's in his mid-30s. Okay. So, just as a note for people I mean, who are wondering. He's but, probably, I think he's 35 or 36. I say that. The problem is, is his career is not going to be... He doesn't, have, he doesn't have as many years as these guys to put some no, accolades on no, the board. You know. No. I'm, 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 of course, just kidding. Oh, right, right. Um, but uh, I will. I hope he wins one before his career is up. He's, he certainly comes close enough to do it. Uh, well, anyway, very interesting Des Moines challenge. I'm a big fan of this tournament. I would love to see it get uh, a little bit better billing in terms of its spot on the schedule. It just feels like it misses out on some players and some hype because of where it falls in the calendar. But it is what it is. It's, it's, yeah. I think it's going to keep drawing because the payouts are so fat. And we'll get to purse watch in a little bit. Um, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we got a 30 second rule. We got to talk about Beast Hole 16 and Finnish Nationals, Estonian Nationals, and of course, purse watch and picks. Stay with us. The 
The Upshot is presented by Pound Disc Golf, makers of the best bags in the sport. I mentioned last week they got some sweet new colorways in the double convertible Rufus, Coyote and Brown Bear, Clay and Sage. They look fantastic. Great way to get the smaller footprint of the Rufus with a little bit of extra space using that double convertible uh, ability to add some space on the sides. They've also got a unique patchwork Octahol in red, white, and blue. Perfect for uh, July. And uh, it's made using leftover scrap fabric, which you just love to see that from Pound. Not wasting material. They also make some uh, zippered pouches in black and turquoise and black and pink that you could throw in your bag to store whatever, snacks, you know, pencils and scorecards, whatever you're feeling. Uh, that's also made using excess scrap fabric. Go to pounddiscgolf.com to check out all of the options. Welcome back to the Upshot. Josh, I want to throw this past you. Okay. July 4th weekend. Yep. Record setting number of people flying. More than 3 million people passed through U.S. airport security checkpoints on Sunday for the first time ever. Wow. Setting another daily record. Uh, I think it's like the 10th. Like there's been like eight or nine record setting days this year. And this is the new high watermark um, in terms of flights. Are are you surprised by that? I'm I'm like trying to think about like, what does this mean? I think everybody's just really rich and everybody and like (laughs) everybody's like trying to travel more post COVID. I I think, I think people are trying to travel more post COVID. Uh, I also think airlines have done, if if you watch trends on uh, airline prices have actually come down. Uh, There was kind of a high, when, it was it was brutal in like 2022. Yes, it was so bad, so bad because of the uh, just the lack of of pilots, um, and so it was very difficult to get prices. And, and prices are coming back down, and so it's feeling more affordable for people to fly, even if they're just going down to like pre-COVID numbers. Uh, and and so those those two factors I think play a big role in in more people flying. But uh, that's that would be my speculation. Pretty pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, it definitely feels busy in the airports. I will say that. Uh, I mean, let's be honest. Calvin Heinberg alone is keeping these airlines afloat. <laughs> I still, I still just do not. I could not believe it. I could not believe it. All right. Let's get to 30 second rule. It's our segment where we have 30 seconds to talk about each topic. And if we go over, it doesn't matter. Josh, take it away. First up, President Cup captain's pick anthony barella is the pick for team usa by yuli uh uh, speaking of anthony he says anthony's won four times this year already on the pro tour and not to mention he plays very well in europe he's without a doubt the right choice for this spot he's a great addition to team usa this is the most obvious pick of all time absolutely yes the the european factor the wins the connection with yuli uh saw that one coming uh nod to charlie over here albert tom has picked uh, oh, uh, sorry, not Al- uh, Sepu Payu, captain for Team Europe, uh, has picked Maori Vilman, uh, which was your prediction, Charlie. So very, very well yeah. done. We were just dis- uh, discussing whether Lettinen might get the the, yeah. the nod, but no. I, it was funny. Lettinen just played better at Finnish Nationals, um, but gets snubbed on the the team uh, Presidents Cup. Oh, roster. Ma- major snub alert. <laughs> Uh, speaking of Maori, Seppo says that Maori is clearly among the elite in Europe, and his recent performances suggest that we can still expect top-notch results for him. I also consider Maori to be a strong performer in one-on-one situations, even though his last two competitions don't necess- necessarily support that view. <laughs> really, Seppo, good, really good to get the, the the vote of confidence from your team captain. Seppo knows that he's snubbing Maori <laughs> and is just putting the justification out right now. Uh, the team needs winners, and Maori is one of them. So, hmm. <laughs> no, I, mean, I think it's the right pick. I, uh, I feel like he could have just left that second part out, Seppo. Uh, he really like... should have. He really should have. <laughs> <laughs> Look, man, the Finns don't pull punches. They they say it like it is. That's we know that about them. So that's the truth. Um, uh, good picks. Here's your total teams. Here they come. Team Europe is Kristen, Evelina, Simon, Nicholas, Vino, Jakub, Semerad. Albert Tom and Maori Villman. Team USA is Missy Gannon, Ella Hansen, Calvin Gannon, Ricky, Eagle, Paul, and AB. Give me USA. 
Yeah, I think so. It yeah. doesn't feel... I think you said this in the last time we talked about it. It doesn't feel as close as it has in previous years. I think the, the USA men's side just feels really strong. Yeah. And I don't know that I feel like the European side is like a lock. Like Kristen, Evelina, stronger as a duo than Missy and Ella, but I could see them splitting. Uh, agreed. Uh, assuming both FPO wins, like, I just... Whoever goes up against Gannon is going to get cooked. I don't know, man. Like, the problem is the back end of Team Europe's men's side is just not up to snuff. Yeah. And so you just uh, worry that they're not th- going to be There is to... a chance, though, that, like, Eagle's was... still not in form. Paul flubs. <laughs> That's Ka- true. And, and we get we get final round European Calvin instead of first round European Calvin. <laughs> like, those three things happen, and this is a ball game. So I mean, it was very close last year. It, it was. It came down to a couple shots late. It does um, not feel it does not feel as close this year, but we'll no, it see. doesn't. All right, uh, what's next? Yeah, th- this is the greatest travesty. Um, they have changed the rules for the Beast Hole 16. Previously, it was bunker rules. If you missed the island, you had to rethrow from wherever you were, la- wherever not where you were last in bounds, but from your last lie until you came to rest in bounds. And you didn't take a penalty stroke; you just took the stroke that you correct had thrown. Yes, correct. Uh, this year they have a double drop zone rule. You throw and you miss the first fairway. There's a drop zone for it. If you throw for the island uh, in the green and miss, then there is a second drop zone that then you advance to up by the green. Charlie, I'll let you go first. All right. So they've completely neutered this hole, right? Like you could still take a big number, a big ish number. But I really don't think you can take more than a double bogey unless you really bork it. Um, so you now also, you could just, int- you, I don't think you would do this, but you could intentionally throw OB off the tee. Uh-huh. You're lying two and you go to the drop zone. And then you got, a, you got a 330-foot shot to the island, or to the basket, I should say. The front edge of the island is probably only like 300 feet. 310 maybe? Yeah. Um. And if you go B again, you're putting from circle two for bogey at the basket. Yes. And like, is that what we want this hole to be? I, I, I just I'm like, who wanted this? So I asked I asked in our discord. How do you feel about the change? I said, are you in favor? Are you neutral about it? Or are you against it? And I asked two options for are you against it? Are you against it because you thought the drama was very interesting last year? Or are you against it because now that feels like there's loopholes in how you mm-hmm. play the hole? Um, and so overall, 85% of people were against it. 13% were neutral. 3% were in favor. So that's one vote, right? But more than one. I, I cut three votes, I think. Oh, did we get 100 100- Around 100 yeah, people? Yeah, 111 okay. votes. Wow, okay, okay, all right. Um, wh- why are we changing this? Like, I, and w- I, this is going to be one of the first questions we ask UC Marisma on Thursday, yep. who's joining the show, the head of the European Open. I I just don't understand. And I've seen a couple things, right? I've, obviously, there was speculation that they wanted to make it less brutal after what happened to AB last year. But how could you want that? Was there right. a more iconic moment last yes. season? I, by the way, no. I'm taking my time out here because yeah. I know I'm going over 30 seconds. So I'm I think you already time. went over 30 seconds. I'm going to have to stroke you. No, 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 no. It's too late. You can't stro- retroactively stroke me. I no, took you the can't time retroactively out. take the time out. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> um, think of, that, that argument literally is going to get made. It's on the going course. to get made. It's going to happen. <laughs> I just feel like that was one of the most interesting moments of disc golf 2023 watching ab by the way because here's the thing you can lay up yes you could throw further up the fairway even and have like a little chip shot like almost a jump putt at the basket right right. you don't have to go for it it's not like it's so hard that it's impossible so there's there's people speculating that it's about barella but i think the PDGA is not offering them a waiver and allowing this to be 
a rated round. I that is my that is my speculation slash guess as to why this rule has changed. And if that's the case, I feel like we need to we need to halt everything, and we need to recognize that the game is different for the professionals than it is for the people who are playing at the A tiers. What's the point? If of you want to say there's no bunker rules allowed at the A tiers, because whatever stroke and distance, blah 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 blah, fine. But the pros need to be able to throw it onto the island. <laughs> if you go to a PGA tournament mm-hmm. and there's a par three on an island green with water all around, and the, they they keep putting it in the water, well then they're going to take a twenty. <laughs> there's not a drop zone. Oh, you get a good chip from the su- no. Hit the green. I don't know. Like, too bad if you stink. Like, lay up and take your take your easy par. Plenty of players did that, including Corey Ellis for most yes. of the tournament last year. Risk reward. This hole had it basically perfect, and now this hole is is just it's just not the same. It's not going to feel as interesting. It's gonna it's gonna decrease the opportunity for that that what if, and I just feel like nobody wanted this. Our Discord is filled with the most hardcore disc golf fans. Three <laughs> percent prefer this change, and and all three of them. Uh, were wearing their Anthony Barella jerseys, hats, and <laughs> necklaces when they said that. <laughs> uh, listen, I mean, this hole used to be on my Dream 18. It's not on my Dream 18 with these rules. It, it, it the the point is that this both the like you said the risk reward, but also the place on the course, right? Mm-hmm. The fact that it's a hole 16 mm-hmm. that is it's coming down the stretch and shapes a very technical hole 17 and another hole 18 that does offer the same risk reward uh it 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 is and and the other thing that you point out right you talk about you know pros having to hit onto an island on the pga tour anthony barella finally did stick the island with a zone this isn't a hard shot for the pros no he was out of position under a branch from a position he hadn't played before and And let the nerves get to him he was too he was too amped up on adrenaline yes yeah and but but that doesn't mean that it's a it's a hard shot or a unfair shot, and I think that sometimes the PG the PDGA, like let's let's not let not and that's my assumption. we don't know if it was the PDGA okay. thing. Let let me let me say it this way then, I think that sometimes disc golf tries to do what is like fair at the expense of good disc golf at times, and then like of entertainment. And uh, yes, this yes. is an entertainment product. This yes, that is that, and I say this about professional sports all the time. People complain, "Oh, these rule changes aren't fair. They're they're not balanced." And it's like, I don't care. I don't care that cornerbacks are becoming absolutely hamstringed in the NFL. It's an entertainment <laughs> product, and it's about making money and viewers. And you just took what was arguably the single, maybe second, if you want to say USDGC holds seventeen. But the single most impactful, exciting hole in all of disc golf and the potential for it and remove that. It's Terrible crazy. decision. It's crazy. All right. Uh, we'll see what uh, UC has to say. I will be very interested. Um, what's next, Josh? Yeah. A couple other re- uh, tournaments happened uh, this weekend. By the way, I'm stroking you because you didn't take a timeout. <laughs> you you took yours late too, so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, a couple of other tournaments happened this weekend uh, over in Europe. Uh, Finland, we have the Finnish Nationals. Evelina Salonen wins by five strokes over Heidi Leina. Um, pretty comfortable uh, there. Yep. Uh, Silva, I think this is the shock. Silva was nine strokes back from Evelina. Well, she got so, crushed. Did you see what happened? No, I did not. Josh. I, I, Josh. She got killed by hole 18. Oh, did she? Look, look! Look at the scorecard. Oh my gosh, the six. Look at the scorecard. Yeah. In round one, round one, six uh, over par on eighteen. She takes a nine, which is six over on hole three or on a par three. And then in round two, it was a little bit better, but she still took a six, a triple bogey. 
Yikes. And then she took a bogey in uh, the final round. So she goes a total of 10 strokes over par on 18, and she lost... Um, sorry, By I forgot nine. there was four rounds. Uh, fourth round, she bogeys again. Yeah, so 11, 11 over par over four rounds on hole 18, and she lost to Evelina by nine strokes. There it is. There it is. I, I watched uh, I watched the uh, MPO stuff, uh, but I didn't watch early rounds FPO. I, I just I just like skimmed some of the late round stuff, and so I didn't see that nine. I wonder if Silva can't throw it over that, that water carry. Dude, it's brutal. It was it was a brutal hole. Uh, in the wind, I mean, it's it's a hard hole, regardless. And it was windy that weekend, this weekend. So, uh, man, tough, tough for Silva. I, mean, I think I think basically the water carries right to edge of her distance potential. I think she tried to lay up and then like went in the water anyway. Uh, it, it was just a complete blunder fest, and like yeah. her confidence was shattered on that hole afterwards. Um, but yeah, I mean that that's tough. And to me, see, that's interesting. That's an example of a hole that maybe doesn't feel fair. Sure. Uh, Unlike yeah, Beast yeah. Hole 16. <laughs> right, right. Uh, over on MPO, there was quite the drama, though. Timu Talikanen wins in a playoff over Nicholas Antla. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's set the stage a little bit here. Timu is 10-12 rated. Uh, so just, just, remind, just again, as we're getting ready for European Open... Temu. Temu. The double vowel doesn't make a hearty sound. It Good extends the vowel. I, I went and listened. They they refer by last name, and I actually yeah. went and listened to the coverage this morning before Good. the podcast. Good stuff. Good stuff. So it, I doesn't, could... it doesn't really make it any easier. Like You have to no. fight your English pronunciation instincts. I know. It's I really need to write it down phonetically when I'm listening so that I have my notes phonetically, not mm-hmm. as it's written. Anyway, <laughs> uh, Nicholas has a collapse i mean uh, it's he had multiple opportunities when he could have kind of put this tournament away and and missed them so this goes back round three hole 18 brutal hole 25 mile an hour ripping headwind 400 foot water carry uh nicholas overturns his disc and never crosses inbound so he goes to the fpo t pad which is the drop zone but still is a pretty hard shot he then goes circles edge Misses the putt off the top of the basket, goes OB, has to putt back, gets a triple bogey. He goes from a four-stroke lead to a one-stroke lead with just that hole. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you, you would have to think that at that point, I mean, that's, if you're playing with a four-stroke lead, that, that feels very different. Um, he would have had, uh, yeah, four strokes on Temu. So then we go into the final round. And Temu plays a clean round, seven down. Nicholas goes six down, but takes two bogeys early and has to kind of fight back from that. So has eight birdies, but the two bogeys really kind of hold him back. But it's all okay because we get to hole 18 and Nicholas has a stroke lead on the box, throws, edge of circle. Looks great. Temu puts it pretty much next to the basket. I mean, it's a bullseye. Nicholas doink is a putt off the top band and misses it they go tied and end up going to a playoff, which is just so sad because like Nicholas hit the clutch putt at the open at Austin to win it. So like, you know, he's got it in him, but uh, it just wasn't his weekend, especially on hole 18. So then you go to the playoff. Temu hits a crazy putt over a giant rock right on the green. Sick putt. In order to keep himself in it really high, but still catches because they're not prodigy baskets. So like really <laughs> impressive there. Uh, and, and then we move to hole five. Nicholas goes overturns his backhand, uh, runs a circle to putt, misses it. Uh, Temu was pretty much parked again uh, and is able to to walk out with the win. Uh, it really feels like this is an opportunity that slipped out of Nicholas's fingers. Shout, shout out to Talikainen. He's the 2022 Finnish junior champion, so he's young. Mm-hmm. It's got to be a name you keep an eye on after this. Uh, it's no cheapy to go win Finnish nationals. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, also had the Estonian National Championship. Albert Tom takes down the win over Mary Villeman by three. That's actually kind of legit. That is legit. I think Villeman was clearly the favorite going in. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely legit. I mean, Albert Tom just, you know what you get from him, and, and it's it's pretty decent typically. Uh, and then Katie Alsalu wins by six over an FPO uh, and, and just puts together a pretty pretty great performance. Being, the, the Estonian field is is solid. You, know, you got Togias Moniste, um mm-hmm. You got a couple of other like legit players. 
Um, Kristen did not play of course, this weekend. Of course. <laughs> that's, that's the other part we got to add in there we, real quick. We think we know who the Estonian champion is in our yeah. hearts. Um, you know, I've got to be honest. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to complain about the names of disc golf tournaments in the U.S. Uh, given the Estonian national championship name, I won't even pretend t- to pronounce it, uh, but it is long it is it is a long name for a disc golf tournament i'm gonna give it my best shot you ready all right i'm, re- I'm ready wienerberger acid lib sd maestro disc golf is 2024 <laughs> <That's> <laughs> honest, i think that was good <laughs> somebody in the discord please tell me how i did <laughs> uh that that is quite the name uh, i didn't <laughs> even know that was estonian national championships until like we saw news elsewhere that it happened and had to put together that that's what that was. So, uh, yeah, that's a tough name for me. <laughs> All right. I think we got one more thing here. Last up, ratings. Uh, ratings update. We mentioned this briefly on the top. Gannon Burr breaks 1050s at 1051 and is now the highest rated player in the world. He's the only player above 1050. Calvin dropped four points primarily because of really good tournament rounds that dropped off uh, from last season. Uh, but Gannon now takes over. Uh, Ricky is in second place, though. Uh on the FPO side, Silva is up five points to 968, making her the ninth highest rated player in the world. Uh, and then Ev- Emily Weatherman got up to 940 without the ratings from this weekend. We were oh, talking yeah. about that. She's going to jump the, up another few points next in month. In the Discord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's got, those thousand rated rounds are not yet on her rating. So she could jump a couple. Uh, shout out to uh, Sophia Donaghy, who's now up to 947 rated. And That's will legit. be in the field at the uh, European Open. Yeah. Good stuff. That's exciting. Yeah. Oh, there it is. There There's it is. the yawn. Oh, there it is. Uh, we're right. We're right by the end, Josh. It's all right. <laughs> Everybody's ready for a nap now. Purse watch. <laughs> Here it comes. Uh, Des Moines challenge. Seventy three thousand two hundred MPO. Thirty four thousand three thirty FPO for a total purse of a whopping hundred and seven thousand five hundred and thirty dollars. That is the second largest payout on the Pro Tour this year, behind the Elite Plus event Portland Open, and it's only behind it by about seven hundred dollars. Um, $648 per person. That's also second best this year behind Portland Open. 13 k uh, which is a high watermark for MPO, tied with OTB and Portland. 8000 for FPO. Uh, this purse was down 1.8% from last year. So still seeing the, the trim happen here. A lot of tournaments flat or even down yep. from uh, a year ago. Uh, th- this will most certainly be the highest three-round tournament payout again. Uh, uh, that's uh, that was the, the we we could right. imagine. But could, yeah, could that, could it happen? It it could happen, right? Like Idlewild last year was ninety-three k. That's that's I, I would be four, sh- very surprised if they that'd be almost up a, that that'd much. be a fifteen percent increase in their purse. No tournament has had a fifteen percent increase in their purse that was on the Pro Tour last year. Or well, Waco. But, but they made it. They an got elite the plus. upgraded status. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they went from the lowest elite series payout in 2022 to an elite plus event. And and Waco's a four round tournament as it's well. Fair. So uh, yeah. that's true. Yeah, all facts. Um, I guess uh, no, there was no TGPT Europe stuff this weekend. So that's no. uh, that's nope. that's it for your purse watch. Uh, but you know, uh, a very strong once again. I think the biggest note is that they didn't match payouts for MPO and FPO winners. Mm-hmm. They had done that in the past. And it had said that they were going to do that on their website. And like that was like one of the selling points for this tournament. They didn't do that. I reached out to the TD, Ty Tanat, and he said, uh, this year, True Bank, their sponsor, and our event team decided to allocate the extra cash from True Bank's title sponsorship evenly across the FPO division. After last year's event, we debriefed with True Bank and agreed it would be more impactful to distribute the additional funds evenly rather than concentrating it all into the first place payout. Um, so there you go. If if it's true that True Bank sponsorship didn't move, it isn't as exciting. But if they're if but I think it is more impactful down the leaderboard. So that's that's my two cents. I don't know, man. Emily Weatherman could have had a pretty sweet uh, That is fair. What's the steakhouse that Chris Dickerson goes to? Uh, Texas Roadhouse. Texas Roadhouse. Could have been a sick Texas Roadhouse night. I mean, right, but last She's year... She's only like, 18, though. It's like, how much money year, can you really spend? That, 
<laughs> Last year they gave Kristen an extra five thousand dollars to put in the trunk of her Porsche. So <laughs> you know that's. <laughs> hey, uh, let me get let me get another Shirley Temple. Let me get another one. <laughs> uh picks i got two points josh got one it was pretty sad showing for us to be perfectly honest with you neither of us picks up any points in fpo as we went missy own val um and josh went own missy val and no podium spots for them as it was uh, locked up by weatherman mittling and natalie ryan uh we both had gannon to win he did not win but he did finish on the podium we both got a point there and i had ab on my podium as i've continued to call for him to break the the slump and he did even better than I expected. So two points for me, one point for Josh. I need that own win, man. I sorry, need those points. Sorry, sorry, dog. No, <laughs> no dog in the final <laughs> no round. Dog, no dog in this one. That's it for today's upshot. We'll be back with you Thursday to get you ready for the Crocal Open. We'll also be talking with UC Metasma about the European Open, which is a week and change away, not nine days away. Very exciting. Uh, get yourself an Ulti World Disc Golf subscription so that you can catch up on all of our uh, Inside the Circle segments. And we'll be doing live shows every day after the European Open round. So join us there. For Josh Mansfield and Charlie Eisenhut saying so long. We'll talk to you Thursday right here on The Upshot. Shot.